Today I'm fortunate to be joined by Mohit, uh, whom I mentioned when I talked about Elmo. Uh, tell the folks who you are. Hi, yeah, I'm Mohit. I'm uh, one of Jordan's former PhD students, and I'm now an assistant professor in, in computer science at UMass Amherst, where I now lead my own group working on NLP. Excellent. Uh, our goal for today is to understand a bit more about massive language models, focusing on BERT, and one of the key building blocks of BERT, the transformer. First, could we review a couple of vocabulary terms that come up with these models and that also help explain why they're so popular? You already talked about masking, pre-training, word pieces, and fine-tuning in the previous video introducing contextual language models. However, you didn't th talk about things like heads and layers. Uh, that's right. Uh, let's remember uh, that we turn a big sentence into word pieces that are particularly important for languages like German uh, or Turkish that have really long words or languages like Chinese that don't have clear word boundaries. So what happens when we have inputs of these word pieces? First, you look up the appropriate token, position, and segment embeddings. Okay, um, and then what's a head? Head. So every time you see a visualization of BERT, it's usually shown as a grid, sometimes with Lego-like pieces or a visualization of attention patterns. Each cell in this grid is a head, and the lines show the attention patterns that the head is using. Intuitively, each head learns to pay attention to different linguistic properties of the input. Check this out, that's a lot of parameters. A bunch of independent heads for each layer. So how do these interact with the input? We'll talk more about what happens in each head in a second, but let's look at a different grid that shows how the layers interact with the input of a sentence. Why is this such a big difference from previous neural language models? Here, you have access to all of the data in every layer, in contrast to RNNs and LSTMs that create its hidden state only from the previous token. Having multiple layers allows different heads to learn different patterns. Here's an animation of how different layers and different heads focus on different parts of the input. We'll see later that, for example, some heads learn to identify noun phrases, which can be important for downstream tasks. Most of the input makes sense to me, but what are those tokens uh, surrounded by brackets? These are special vocabulary tokens that are utilities. BERT assumes a fixed length input, so if your input is too short, you need to add special tokens to the end of the string to pad it out when you're batching several examples together. The SEP token separates different parts of your input, like if you have multiple sentences or if you have a question in an answer pair. Probably most importantly, the CLS token is where, for example level tasks, you can attach a classifier to decide if a sentence has positive or negative sentiment, for example. But we just argued that you want to be able to use context from the whole sentence to make these sorts of decisions. Isn't this just going back to the problem of Elmo, where you have to propagate everything to wherever the CLS position is? It might look like that at first glance, but because each layer has access to all of the previous layer's heads, it has the full context. But at the end, you need to gather it all together somewhere, and by convention, it's the CLS token for BERT. So every head at every layer has a different parameterization? Yes, which is why BERT models have such huge memory footprints. Well, how many layers does a BERT model typically have? In models that you can easily download, BERT base has 12 layers and BERT large has 24 layers. And you typically have something like 16 independent heads per layer. Do we actually need all those heads and layers? It seems like you do for training, at least, but we'll talk about some interesting results um, involving distilling and pruning models a little later if you actually want to deploy these models. Let's talk a little bit more about why having access to all of the input is important. For language modeling or doing translation, you have to carry messages through the hidden state. For example, in an early uh, neural translation paper, the representation of both the input and the output are fundamentally left to right. But this earlier Google work also shows the importance of attention. When translating between languages, you often need to look at the whole source sentence to decide what to translate next. So BERT took it to the next level and used attention to get access to everything? 
Exactly, and this mostly works, and there might be psycholinguistic reasons that you should model things this way. For example, if you have a human doing simultaneous translation. But if a computer is doing translation, or even if a human is doing translation at their desk without time pressure, you should be able to use any part of the sentence to do the translation. And BERT lets you do that for just about any task. Haven't vision folks been doing this forever with convolutional nets where you take all the inputs, merge them together into a tree? Yes, but the original attention is all you need paper argues that you still have a pathing effect to find relationships between parts of the input. And in language, you can have arbitrarily long relationships between components. For example, in this German sentence, the main verb aufstellen is split into two. And the second part of the verb auf is always at the end of the sentence, no matter how long the sentence is. And it's not just the verb being split into, the subject is also far away from the second half of the verb. We're mostly talking about BERT today since it's been open sourced from the beginning and it's easier to play around with, but another model called GPT is often in the news. But the bigger reason we're not talking about it is because it's not named after a Muppet and thus lacks a connection to Maryland. Well, probably the most salient difference is that BERT is a mask language model that has access to context on both sides, whereas GPT is a left to right language model that only has access to tokens on the, the left hand side. This is also called an autoregressive framework, which makes it easier to train and more data efficient. Um, however, many of the intuitions from BERT can be carried over. And the Verge's James Vincent reports that they consider naming it Snuffle Up. Interesting, a Muppet that we're not sure exists and the, at the very least only a select few can interact with. Interesting. Okay, is that uh, it for the preliminaries? Can we talk about how Bert actually encodes a sentence now? Sure, let's go over Bert's fundamental building blocks first. The transformer, which comes from the paper attention, is all you need. We'll go over how a Bert head encodes and transforms its input. Okay, first, let's talk about what a transformer uses to compute attention. What are keys, values, and queries? Before we get to the content, we have to talk about those parentheses. You would never have let me write an equation like that. Are you going to have that monstrosity in the slides? Oh, no, let's pretty that up a bit. What are the inputs and outputs of this? One simplistic way to think about this is that you have a table of outputs, the values, and you need to pick which of these values you're going to return. Let's start with the keys. As with most things in neural models, these are vectors. Given the name, each of these keys must be associated with some value, right? That's right. You can think of it as a lookup table. But which key gets selected? Both the keys and queries are vectors, so it's the values associated with the key and the value that had the highest dot product with the query. Okay, so to draw this out in 2D, we have these keys. A query comes in. It's closest to key 2. So we look up that value in the table and output value 2. But because we're going to throw all of this into our favorite computation graph framework, we can't do non-differentiable things like find the largest and output the value. Ah, so that's why we have this softmax thing. So it weights the values by the score of the similarities. Exactly, but the intuition is still useful. This process gets repeated through each of the layers until you have a representation at the top layer. So is that all there is? No, there's also a feedforward network to generate the output, residual connections, and regularization. There are also some details about the positional embeddings, which use sinusoidal functions. How important are these? The feedforward layers and positional em embeddings are also very important. The feedforward layers in particular contain the majority of the model's parameters. So while the community has converged on this transformer architecture, that, that doesn't mean that people aren't trying to improve it. Uh, however, there was a recent paper by Google researchers that showed that uh, despite 20 or 30 different variants of the transformer being proposed over the past couple years, none of them significantly improve over the original transformer model when you do properly controlled experiments. So this is what we have for now. We're also not talking about decoding yet. 
That's right. So while we have enough information to use something like BERT, this isn't enough to actually implement BERT. Although to be fair, most people shouldn't be trying to implement their own transformer language model. You don't have enough compute to compete with the likes of Facebook, Microsoft, Google, and OpenAI. Yeah, not even OpenAI can replicate OpenAI's research. They realized they had a minor bug in their data pre-processing, but it was too expensive to rerun their training at such a large scale. Okay, uh, that's enough for now. When we come back, we'll talk about what BERT can discover and whether BERT uh, needs to be as big as it is. If you want to see more videos like this, check the video description for the course that comes from the link down below. You can then see the context and the correct order for watching these videos. YouTube will gleefully show you stuff in the wrong order. If you want other people to see this video, provide a big gradient to the recommendation algorithm by clicking the like and subscribe button down below.